Welcome back after, after lunch, and I'm very pleased to introduce myself as the first speaker of the afternoon. I get to host myself, so I can talk for as long as I want and not take any difficult questions. Okay, so welcome back. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the Release Project, which is a uh, European-funded project that's been running since 2011 and will be uh, terminating early next year. And our, our, our goal in this um, was, was to try and scale Erlang, and we, we've sent 10,000 cores there. Um, and I'll talk about how far we've got in, in trying to do that. Uh, the, the project involves a number of partners, uh, a number of universities, companies that begin with E, um, Erlang Solutions, EDF, and Ericsson, and, and university partners in Sweden um, and the UK, uh, Sweden, Greece, and the UK. So very much like this is uh, Chris said, pinching words from Chris, and, and indeed from, from some of the talks earlier on, I, I think we, it's become a commonplace, you know, I can explain to, to anyone, they say, I've got a dual core machine, that m multiple, m multiple core machines are the norm rather than the exception. And the number of cores is growing for reasons of energy and power consumption and, and um, heat generation and so on. So we're familiar with that, and we're familiar with the fact that, that they're being used in all sorts of different contexts, they're for, uh, in, in, inside embedded systems, for doing things like graphic, graphical processing, um, but also they're becoming the norm in... in and we see that the, one of the, the, the rationale of the rationale for this project is that we feel that they're going to become the norm for general purpose systems as well. And so we're asking the question in this project, what are the right programming models and tools for using to program general purpose, you know, server software, um, general purpose software on this sort of platform? And I think you know, it's interesting, the, the, the leader of the project is Phil Trinder, um, and in the sense I'm giving the talk in his, on his behalf. Um, it's interesting to reflect on a project like this once it's been running for a while, and what's intriguing is that we've not come up with a big bang. You know, we've not come up with a, 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 a product we can give you at the end of the session which will immediately allow you to, to go off and, and write things at, at massive scale. But what we've done is attack that problem on a number of different fronts um, and hopefully made some progress on, on all of those. I think... The things that we were looking for in, um, in doing this was a realization that if you are running on, on a massively multi-core system, then core failures are, are going to become a, an issue. You, know, you will have, if you have a, a system which uses a lot of cores, you look at the mean time between failures, you're going to get failures within a system. And you need to, you need to build something that will allow you to, to handle that in a graceful way. And also we need things that are going to be scalable. Um, so I don't think there's anything. Sometimes I get asked to comment, the university writes a plan, and it produces 20 pages. And you think you can cross out 19 and a half pages of it because they're just the obvious thing that you would always say. We all want scalability. We all want robustness. Um, so you know, that, I don't think I'm saying anything particularly contentious here. So the aim that we had, and the, the, uh, the aim of the project, was to use the actor model, concurrency-oriented paradigm, to build these reliable general purpose systems, and to aim at, at um, we said 10 to the 5 there, we've said 10,000 sometimes, to aim at large numbers of cores. And the crucial thing, I think, the crucial insight we had was let's build on Erlang. If you look at the Erlang infrastructure, I've discovered a good way of, of building slides, is you type Erlang into Google Images and you see what it, it comes up with. Um, and you can see... It's weird, it's simple, it has some useful things, it has some interesting Erlang people there. It, has, it shows that the Erlang, the Erlang um, ecosystem is a strong one. It's one where people are used to building um, scalable, reliable systems. And what they're building on is, is this, effectively. And I'm, I'm sure this is familiar to most of you, but just there are one or two points that, that we should make about the approach we've taken that it's worth just, just running over. So we live in a world where a typical host, you know, a physical machine, will have, um, will have a number of cores, and 
as you know, you can run um, you can run Erlang nodes on multiple cores. And indeed, Erlang comes out of the box now as a multi-core system. What it's worth being aware of is that within those yellow boxes, they're not black boxes, within those yellow volumes, um, we don't really have much control of what goes on. The OTP team are, are supply us with a um, system where you have a, a run queue per core, and that's all dealt with. We are not expected as Erlang programmers to worry about run queues. We're not expected to worry about which processes sit on which queue. That's dealt with by the, the system out of the box. So we, the way that we can organize as programmers on top of this is to, is to deploy those, those yellow volumes. We can deploy Erlang nodes. Um, and you can see in that picture that you can, one way of using Erlang distribution is to, um, is to deploy a number of, of nodes on the same on the same host, a number of uh, sorry yeah a number of nodes on the same host. So each of them involves a few cores. You can do that. The other thing to say is that the model, the the um, Erlang distribution model, where you're connecting different Erlang nodes together, is one where out of the box everything is connected to everything else. And I think that's how it's illustrated there. So each node there is connected to, to every other node. So that's the sort of model we're playing with, and we're thinking, well, how does that map onto, um, onto a much larger system? One thing we had to think about is, um, here's a, a picture of, of, think of each of these groups of, of, um, of boxes as a, um, a host. So we've got a number of cores on each. Got to think about what happens with core failure. And the model at the moment is if one of your cores fails, you effectively take out the whole machine. So if we're thinking of, um, at the moment, of using Erlang distribution as a way of scaling, then what we, we have to think of is each node being mapped onto a, or each host being mapped onto a single Erlang node. Now, in the future, I think that, would, that potentially could change, and we could use Erlang distribution as a way of assembling, as a way of, of marshalling together different cores on the same host. But we need to be able to deal with that sort of failure, um, with the failure of a core, perhaps on the same piece of silicon, perhaps on a, on a different piece of silicon. Um, but the way we've looked at it at the moment, and the way that, that Erlang handles this, is if a single core isn't working, you take the whole host out. So that's, that's a design decision we've taken. So I think I've just reiterated that, that Erlang Multicore is black box. Well, it's, it's sort of yellow box in terms of the diagrams. Um, we don't change that, but one thing we've had to do is, is if you're looking at building systems like this, we've had to think about observing behavior on multicore systems. We want to be able to understand, because it, uh, one of the lessons from this is you need to measure. You maybe think you know how systems are going to behave, but you don't know until you, until you measure. Um, and as I've said, that, that core failure leads to, to host failure here, and that may change. But, but for the moment, the, the way we've, we've made this, the, uh, des the design choice we've made is, is this one. Okay, so we said we'd build on Erlang, but um, the scalability that Erlang has is, is in practice is constrained. And these have been the things that we've been, we've been attacking as part of this project. So there are things, and there are other things that perhaps we've not attacked yet. Um, there are aspects of the virtual machine. For example, synchronization on, on internal data structures. When you move from a model which is concurrent, but single, single processor, to a model where you have true things going on at the same time, then some of the assumptions that were there built right into the, the implementation of the virtual machine, like the model for tracing, need to change. So, for example, synchronization, locking on internal data structures has been something we've looked at. And obviously having the OTP team as part of the project has, has been very important for that. There are language aspects. Um, so the issue about the out-of-the-box behavior of, of everything being connected to everything else, a fully connected network of nodes, that's something we wanted to look at. And about what happens when you spawn processes. Are there, do we need to think about 
what we do about placing processes when we spawn them. And we thought about tool support, about deployment of these sorts of systems, about observing them, about visualizing them, and so on. So we tried to, and here's a, I've got a diagram that, that summarizes, I hope, the sort of approach we've taken. So we've, we've looked at the virtual machine and tried to, to optimize, measure and optimize things there. On top of that, we've built um, a library called Scalable Distributed Erlang, or SD Erlang, which handles some of the, um, some of the questions about what you get in, in terms of out-of-the-box behavior. We've tried to build on top of that infrastructure that allows us more easily to, to scale and observe larger systems. And cross-cutting, we've looked at, at tools, a variety of tools to, to support this, and looked at some case studies. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the, the, this talk is to give a brief description of each of those areas. This is partly a plug for a, a series of tutorials tomorrow, and there's also a talk that in the last slot today which tells you more about SD Erlang. So this is, if you like, a taster um, of, what, of what we've been doing, a high-level hovercraft overview of the, of the material. So if we start off with the virtual machine, um, no, the, the, are we there yet? the cry of, of, of your children when you, you've set off on a journey. What we wanted to do right at the start of the project was think, well, can we benchmark? Can we look at how things scale? So if we don't know how things in practice behave, it's going to be difficult for us to, um, to change the behavior, to improve the behavior of, of real systems. And it's interesting, I was talking to somebody over lunch about this. One of our problems has been there aren't a huge number of Erlang distributed systems out there in the wild. There are you know, people, there are a number of very high profile Erlang systems, distributed systems, but it's not, m the majority of Erlang uh, systems are not, typically not distributed. Or they are working on a very small number of, of, of hosts and so are not, are not aiming for scalability in the way that we're looking. So one of the first things we did was build this bench Earl system. Um, this was the people at, at Uppsala and um, ICCS in Greece. And this provides a nice benchmarking a set of scripts to do benchmarking of, um, of Erlang systems. So uh, there's, the, there's the URL up there if you want to get hold of this. Um, and this shows, for example, um, I think this is showing scalability of dialyzer on um, a, it says it has all the information there, Intel Xeon, blah de blah, eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, and it's showing you a number on, on a particular release of Erlang. So it allows you to, to, to look at scalability behavior on different Erlang releases, and there, are diff there is different performance on different releases. It allows you to, um, it turns on different options and so on. So you have a, a, a variety of things that you can do using, um, using these scripts. And you get this, you get this visualization. Um, what else do we see? We've also done some, um, looked at the, the infrastructure. So this has been work done by the OTP team and others. Um, looking at the way that ETS storage behaves, and I've got some slides about that in a second. Um, looking at the way that memory is allocated and deallocated. And there, again, it's a, ma it's a matter of doing detailed stuff within the, um, within the virtual machine about looking at the locking of data structures. I mentioned the earlier the issue of tracing, and that's another. You know, all these things get, get built, get hardwired into. You make an, a number of assumptions when you build a virtual machine, and some of those have to be suspended when you look at a, a truly multi-core. Organizing process tables and port tables, um, modeling processes and port signals. So there's a lot of detail here. Um, again, you'll find, find more about this in, in, um, in Erlang release notes um, as, as well as at, at the Uppsala website. Um, and a particular piece of work that hasn't gone into, um, into Erlang because it may have, um, it may have consequences for uh, particular, particular Erlang, uh, existing Erlang programs. This is to do, when you do a copy of a, um, of a term in doing message passing, if you have, if you have um, sharing in that, in that term, 
what happens at the moment is that that sharing gets expanded out. So if you have two pointers to a large subterm, what happens when you do the, the um, when you send a message with that term as the payload, the subterm gets copied. So you can, your messages can, can um, message send can, can behave very badly in that sort of context. So what, um, what this part of the project has done is deliver a, um, a mechanism for sharing, um, preserving sharing within terms when they're copied as messages. And there are particular situations where that's of, of real value. If you're sending around pieces of code or whatever, um, then that can, be, that can be really important. But because its behavior may not always improve things, um, it's, not been, it's not gone into the standard, deep down into the standard release. Um, and here's some, some results about scaling. You can see as the releases have gone on, there's been gradual improvements. Small is, is good in these tables. Um, and you can see that the, the progress from R11 to R16 has been one of, of producing much better scaling behavior um, for ETS set tables. Whereas there's been slightly less good behavior for, for ordered sets. And so that was, a, that was clearly a place where it's, it's more difficult to achieve um, optimal behavior. And so I think there's, there's, there's clearly more work needs to be done in, in dealing with ordered sets. Um, and this, this shows the scale of what happens in R16 with the various concurrency options for ETS tables. You can see that, that they are, um, again, they're, they're giving very good performance, particularly for sets. Um, if you look at, you can see the reading and read-write read -write options there, giving you good, good performance. So the lessons, for, lessons learned there is that ordered sets are not, are not, are not working um, as they might be. Locking is a problem still, but is, is getting improved. I was talking to Kenneth about this before, before lunch. Numa is a problem in general, in that what, what is happening is that, that the virtual machine makes some decisions about what architecture it's targeting. Um, and as things stand, it's not, there aren't the options for, for um, tuning it for different architectures. Um, but of course, that's possible. But that's, I guess that's a general issue that where, where um, that level of the system is being provided centrally. Um, and then some general advice about good behavior um, for read and write, the places in which to use the read and write concurrency option. OK, so that covers what's gone on in the virtual machine. And still, there's still more work going on there. Oh, and another thing to say, that we have been, we've been eating our own dog food, as it were, that we've been looking at our own systems and trying to, to parallelize them too. And quite a lot of the work, um, for instance, the work on term sharing uh, came out of parallelizing dialyzer. And we did so we've done our own work on, on uh, parallelizing aspects of, of Wrangler, which I'll talk about a bit later on. OK, so what have we done in SD Erlang? Um, what we've looked to do in SD Erlang was to build, um, to, to provide some patterns for interconnection. So we looked at various options. And the one we came up with was to allow you to put nodes into groups and have full con connectivity within those groups, but um, to make those groups, not have a single group where everything is connected to everything else, which, which tends to be the default. What we've also allowed is for um, overlapping between groups. So the sort of architecture you see here is one where, for example, you have each of these subgroups is performing a partition of a task. Um, and then the, no the nodes in the overlap are the, the bridge between that subtask and the central node, which is collecting all the information together. So that sort of topology allows that, that kind of distribution um, to be performed. So you have, um, you have part of the problem solved there, part of a problem solved there, part solved there, and then collecting the information in the center. Um, so the distribution out of the box, sorry, this is just a cheesy animation. Um, but obviously, if you have a model like that uh, and you have everything connected to everything else, you get in quadratic complexity. And, and you begin to you see this in. Um, in looking at scalability, 
Um, this is the, the DE bench benchmark from, from, um, from Basho. And looking at there at different, different levels of, um, of global operations, um, you, get, you get straight line scalability with the red, uh, but the more global operations you add, the, the, the more your scalability gets throttled at, at, um, at certain points. And that's simply because um, your, your global operations are growing in size. Um, and this is a scalability of REAC. This was work done by the, the group at, um, at Heriot Watt at Glasgow, um, who moved to Glasgow, plus people at John Meredith at Basho, looking at scalability for, for REAC. And there you begin to see there with that your, your scaling falls off at, at about 70 nodes. Um, so as I say, distribution out of the box is looking like this. Um, and what we're providing is this, this model where you can, in principle, have smaller, smaller groups and that, that connectivity. So it's, it's based on the global group concept that is in Erlang. But in, with global groups, those were a partition. There was no overlap. And having the overlap here, allow, it supports a number of different topologies. For example, what you're getting is some sort of hierarchy here, with the bridge nodes being the bridge between the top level and the, and the next level down. Um, and of course, you can build ad hoc models. Um, and this is where we begin to see we're able to run SD Erlang on. This is up to... 1,400 nodes. So this is, this is the closest we get to 10,000. But as you can see, we're not at the end of the project yet. So we have, a, we have that goal. We have that goal out there. And you're seeing there that we're getting with, um, we're able to push with SD Erlang up to, up to that limit. Whereas we, were we had to stop with Erlang at, at 1,200 nodes. So we are getting that sort of scalability. Um, but let's talk a bit about what S groups, what we can do with S groups. Um, the operations you have on these, you can create and delete them. You can add and remove nodes, um, and you can get back information about S groups and their contents. And you can register and unregister names. And this is where the the, the global operations, or the operations which belong to a group, come in. Um, that naming names are shared within an S group, not globally. So you're having, um, you know, for example, in, um, you might share, this group will share that name, um, this group will share probably the name of the, of the central process. So there you're getting a natural hierarchy is mapped onto those, um, mapped onto that topology. Um, and that allows us to build these, and you can imagine, you can scale this out hierarchically as, as far as you wish to go. So that's the, the, and this appear, is a library in Erlang, which um, uh, is, is relatively easy to use. We, what we've also done is, um, the other thing that goes along with having this sort of, um, this sort of model is the ability to, um, to have slightly more freedom in the way that you uh, spawn new processes. So instead of saying, I want to spawn it there, we give you the ability to choose where you're going to spawn it according to attributes, how loaded a, pro uh, how loaded a node is, the, the proximity of a node to the node that you're on, so you can, within the same group, or perhaps one or two groups away. Um, so we're able to um, allow you to spawn things according to the, the, this, this higher level view of the system, rather than saying, I want it on that particular node. So we, we're giving you that level of abstraction there. We did a nice, I think it was nice because we, we did it at Kent, we did a nice piece of work um, of using Quick Check. So we had our implementation, and the guys at Glasgow said, let's build an operational semantics. And I thought, well, there's not really much point in having an operational semantics unless we can execute it. And then the obvious thing when, when you've got an executable semantics is you try it out, um, you try out random combinations of, of the operations. So we built a nice Quick Check model of the um, of how S groups should work, um, and we were able to do that, and that we we had a nice balance between finding errors in the in the specification, errors in the implementation, and some some inconsistencies which where we couldn't we couldn't quite apportion blame, but we found that that was a useful way of of doing some debugging, so that was a nice nice application. 
Right, how am I doing for time? Oh, okay. Nobody's telling me when I have to stop, so that's fine. At the third level up, we're thinking about operations and maintenance. Um, and this is where the Erlang Solutions contribution has come in. They're concerned, they have customers who are concerned with running large Erlang deployments. So what they wanted to do was build a tool that will support that, and this will also, also support the work we're doing here on SD Erlang. So what this does is give you visibility about what's going on in Erlang clusters, either standalone or it will integrate with other O&M. Um, so here you see, you can see, for instance, um, it will gather metrics. So you're getting metrics of, of data, of um, total memory, all sorts of memory metrics, total memory, atom memory, and so on. So you can gather those metrics across your, um, across your system, and you can classify that according to different Erlang releases, different aspects of the system, and so on. Um, what Wombat does is it's an Erlang process that sits on every monitored node, um, and it sits there gathering metrics, doing some logging, raising alarms, and so on. So it's a relatively small piece of code that's injected into each, to each Erlang node. Um, and you know, for one example, you can see here some alarms that have been raised. These are you know, the sort of alarms you're seeing are, are node down, um, got a disk almost full. So you can, you can describe events where you want to be notified, um, and this gives you a dashboard of that sort of, that sort of problem. Um, and you can, you can see that the ones at the top have been cleared, so the node is no longer down, it's been brought back up. But there are other um, major and major, minor alerts there that need to be dealt with. OK, so the final aspect of what we've been doing is, is doing various things with tools. So you heard me talk at, about Wrangler um, yesterday, just to say that some of the work we've been doing there has been supporting, um, supporting this project as well as supporting other things. So we've got um, refactorings for introducing S groups and other parallel um, some other parallel refactorings, complementary to the stuff that Chris is doing, um, refactoring groups to S groups and so on. And we've done some parallelization, as I said. You maybe saw Stavros's talk yesterday about Conqueror. That's also been developed as part of this project. Um, so it allows you to explore interleavings between processes, focusing on race conditions. Um, and they've done a number of case studies, MokiWeb and, and, and Poolboy. Lot more, lots more information there on the um, Conqueror website. We've also done some work, and there's a, a, a tutorial tomorrow about this, about taking the Percept tool, which is part of the standard Erlang distribution. Um, and what that does is it profiles, profile systems. You can then analyze them and display the results in a browser. And what we've done is extend that so that it supports um, a number of features which are particularly to do with running on multi-core. Um, so for example, um, what you can see up there is a picture, what, what Percept out of the box does, is give you a picture of runnable process. Uh, when a process is runnable, each line there represents the behavior of a process. When a process is runnable and when it's not. What we've done is, is refine that so that you can see the orange there is, indicates runnable, the green indicates it's actually running. So you get a more refined picture of the behavior of all your processes. So I should say this is an offline tool. You, you profile, and then afterwards you do the, do the analysis. Um, we've added to it information about scheduler migration, for example. So you see, even in quite, you know, even in quite small systems, you might have a process will migrate between schedulers perhaps a dozen times. Um, this is part of the, the built-in, as I said earlier on. This is stuff that you want to, even though you don't have a handle on it, it's useful to know that that's going on as part of the, um, the standard Erlang multi-core multi implementation. So what happens there is that there's work stealing between different, um, different run queues, and you can see even in a relatively modest application, you might have, um, you might have quite substantial movement of processes between run queues. Um, we build a dynamic call graph. We allow you to link from particular, um, particular processes in this sort of model to 
the source code for that process, and so on. So what we tried to do there is give you as much information as we can about the behavior post hoc of, of running system. Um, we've also, to address scalability, tried to present information about processes in a, um, in a scalable way. So you can start off with a process root and then only expand for the processes that has spawned and so on, as far as you wish to go. Um, and you can profile in a selective way. And we also do, we use parallelization to perform the analysis in parallel. So that if you have a number, if you're profiling a long-lived system, you put your um, analysis data into a number of files, and those can all be processed in parallel. So more information about that in a tutorial tomorrow, but also um, online, as indicated there. And just a, a picture here of some work we used, some, some screenshots of um, what we did in parallelizing Wrangler. Here you see the number of active processes at any time during the, during the um, execution. So you see there's a whole lot of stuff going on in parallel there. But then in this section, you're, you've only got one or two processes running at any one time. Um, and uh, you can see the, the picture of those two processes that are running at that point. Um, and for example, uh, this was the sort of, of um, parallelization that we saw. So a bit again, this, this hint back to what Chris was saying earlier. What we had here was a, um, a list comprehension and that turns quite naturally into parallel map. What we did find, and I think this was, this was clearly true in the, in the dialyzer case as well, is that in practice, unfortunately, we don't tend to write things in a format that's, that's easily or always easily parallelized. So for example, here was a, a case we were examining, examining clone candidates, and that should be, you'd think, should be something where we, um, things are done in parallel. There was a tiny little bit of information threaded through there. You can see that the number there in the, re in the tail call is incremented by one. What we're doing effectively there is just each of, the, um, each of those instances is given a unique identifier, which is a number. And we're doing that by, by using a parameter to the function. Now, of course, that, that sequentializes code that doesn't need to be sequential. So what we have to do instead is, um, turn, first of all, turn that into a zip of the, the tasks that we have and the numbers we're going to give them. And then we can, um, we can turn that into a parallel for each. So I think you know, one of the things that we, we felt in practice was you need, to, you need something which will give you this sort of analysis so that we could see that something was going on here where we could this was, this was causing a bottleneck, but we had to examine it ourselves and do some refactoring by hand before we were able to, um, to enable that final, that final parallelization. So I guess we had to replace what was going on there by a for each, and then we could do the turn the for each into a parallel for each. But you know, that's life, right? The other thing that we did um, was build some tools for visualizing what's going on. Um, on the right, you see a tool that's showing you how S groups are behaving. Um, and what you see there is the intensity of a line shows the intensity of communication between, um, between those two nodes. And each of the circles represents an, an S group. Now you'd think, why, are there, com why there, are there lines that join things that are not in the same S group? And that's a result of some s initial setup code, sending some messages around. Um, on the left is perhaps more interesting. This is a picture of um, this is an online visualization, so a real-time visualization you can get of the behavior of um, a program running. Now, this is a two-processor, so the top half is one processor, the bottom half is another processor. Each um, processor has six cores, so there's six, that, those are six ellipses there, and on each um, core are running two hyperthreads. So what you're seeing here, so there's a scheduler per hyperthread. So there are 24 schedulers going on there. And what you're seeing here is um, size of the, the run queue. So we're coloring for 
The length and the color both indicate the size. Um, so you've seen the size of the cubes, and also you've seen process migrations there. So it's showing you an, an animation, either, either post hoc or, or in real time, of how your program is behaving on a particular, a particular host. In the, and that's in the small, and that's showing it rather more in the large. Um, I, think we've, I think in our final, our final version of this, we've, it was interesting to look at modeling the S groups as, as overlapping circles. But I think it's not, that's not going to be a, a visualization that's going to scale. We've involved some visualization people at Kent in doing this. And there are lots of different ways you can do it. And this, it's an interesting experiment, but we'll find another way of doing it finally. I think you, you, you color things um, for proximity. OK, but this we found interesting. I mean, you see you know, there are phenomena going on. You see quite a lot of um, cross-processor migrations, for example. Those are the lines going from north to south. You also see that size of run queues is different on the, on the two hyper threads on the same process, on, on the same core. So interesting, you, know, you just get to see stuff. You get to, to understand how your system is behaving by having this sort of visualization. Um, we've done some work on, on supporting tracing. So the, the guys at ICCS have done a lot of work on enhancing uh, what you can do with DTrace and system tap and added a back end for Percept 2, which uses system tap. That gives us a better scalability. I mean, it, it involves, um, it's less invasive than using system tracing. And also with system tap, it's an operating system level tracing facility. So you can trace things in the VM as well as in Erlang at the same time. And we've also done some work on um, enhancing, enhancing Erlang tracing again to try and help with scalability. So logging only nodes between messages. I mean, one of the problems with tracing is that you can generate too much information. So what you want to do is only generate the stuff you want um, rather than generate it and then filter it out at a later stage. So we've built in stuff for logging only into node messages and also filtering log messages as they're generated. So you, d you only generate messages of a particular kind. Right, I'm drawing to a close. Um, and just to mention a couple of case studies that we've, we're, we're looking at. One is Simdiaska. This is coming from EDF in France. They have a large um, simulation framework built in Erlang, where in fact an object-oriented layer on top of Erlang, which they use for simulating things like the French electricity network, simulating smart meters across, across very, large, um, very large areas, large numbers. So they can involve millions of, of, of interacting, interacting entities. And also, we're in the process of porting Erlang to the Blue Gene queue, which is, again, a you know, IBM supercomputer. That's not complete, so this time next year, we'll have more to tell you about that. So to sum up, here's the, here's the consortium. Erlang Solutions, Ericsson, and Electricity Data France, the University of Glasgow, Kent, Uppsala, and ICCS. Um, we continue until next February, so I think this time next year, we'll be able to give you a final overview of, of the, the project. project website is there, and we, we acknowledge the support of the, the European Union. So, questions? <laughs> so, the guy with the questions. If you have any questions, there's a microphone. There's one at the back there. In the, um, in the uh, Devo tool you showed, um, it sort of uh, gave um, sort of the thickness of the lines between um, for message passing. Mm -hmm. uh, does that count uh, merely the number of messages passed, or does it count other properties such as memory? I mean, we can do either. The way it was showing there was just the number of messages, or the frequency of messages being passed. But it's, we can configure that either for size or total volume or um, average size. So that's, that's configurable. Thank you. There's a question here. Uh, 
Uh, have you had a chance to compare Erlang's concurrency with the Go from Google? Because yeah. they're addressing concurrency as well, claiming it's going to be really good at it. So, I mean, we haven't. No, I mean, I think concurrency is not. Well, I don't know. There, there are there are a number of different levels you can look at this. What we've been looking at. Um, there's, there's bare, almost bare metal concurrency. How much can you achieve in terms of, of concurrent processes? That's one question, which really we haven't been addressing. But the question is, what can you do at the, at the distributed system level? And that's what we're looking at. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good.